This is WBCQ, bringing world's last chance radio to you from Monticello, Maine, USA. The heart longing of every Christian for the last 2,000 years has been to see the Saviour return and set up an everlasting kingdom on earth. Events in the world reveal that this will happen very soon. Keep listening to learn how you can spiritually prepare for Earth's final events. WLC Radio, preparing a people for life in Yahweh's earthly kingdom to be established upon Christ's imminent return. Marriage. For some people, it's heaven on earth. For others, it's a foretaste of hell. Hi, I'm Oz Roby, and you're listening to World's Last Chance Radio. Throughout time, there have been different forms of marriage. In ancient times, some cultures practiced polyandry, or one wife with multiple husbands. In patriarchal cultures, and even some today, there's polygamy, or one husband with multiple wives. Ever since 2001, when the Netherlands took the lead, more and more countries have been legalizing same-sex marriages too. However marriage is defined, it always includes the idea of a union that promises mutual obligations. Usually these include legal obligations as well. Marriage has been around a long time, but what often confuses believers is marriage in the kingdom of Yah. Are we even going to have marriage in Yahuwah's kingdom? What happens to married couples who were both saved if there is no marriage? And where does this idea come from that there will be no marriage in Yah's kingdom? Dave Wright is going to discuss marriage in Yahuwah's kingdom today, and he's going to look at a particular passage that has caused a lot of confusion on the subject. Later, during our Daily Mailbag segment, we'll be sharing some ideas you can use to share with others why it's not necessary to be members of one particular denomination in order to be saved. And then, of course, Elise O'Brien will have another promise to share that you won't want to miss. So that's our lineup today. Uh, Dave, will there be marriage in Yahweh's kingdom set up on earth? Well, I do believe so, yes, and we're going to look at why this makes sense from the biblical evidence because it's quite a common assumption that after Yahushua returns, the marriage relationship will cease to exist. See, that comes from one of Yahushua's own statements, though, doesn't it? Well, um, that's how we've interpreted his statement, but I don't think that we've interpreted what he said correctly. Now, right. first of all, we need to take into account the context in which his statement was made. Now, you see, context is always very important. Now, this statement from which people extrapolate that there'll be no marriage in eternity, this comes from a conversation that is recorded almost identically in the Gospels. And we're going to take a look at it in Mark, as Mark is believed to be the earliest Gospel that was actually written down. So let's go there to Mark chapter 12. Mark 12 opens with the statement, Then he began to speak to them in parables. Now, this continues on through to verse 11. And then what does it say in verse 12? And they sought to lay hands on him, but feared the multitude, for they knew he had spoken the parable against them. So they left him and went away. So the scribes and the Pharisees, the Jewish leaders, are angry at what Yahushua is saying. They want to get even with him, and the best way they think to do that is to discredit him in front of the multitudes. Can you pick up the story again in verse 13? What happens next? Then they sent to him some of the Pharisees and the Herodians to catch him in his words. When they had come, they said to him, Teacher, we know that you are true and care about no one. For you do not regard the person of men, but teach the way of Yahuwah in truth. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Shall we pay or shall we not pay? But he, knowing their hypocrisy, said to them, Why do you test me? Bring me a denarius that I may see it. So they brought it. And he said to them, 
Whose image and inscription is this? They said to him, Caesar's. And Yahushua answered and said to them, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to Yahuwah the things that are Yahuwah's. And they marveled at him. And they marveled at him. You see, the Pharisees had tried to lay a trap. If he said you should not pay taxes, they denounced him to the Romans as a troublemaker. But if he said they should pay taxes, they denounced him to the people who were resentful of having to pay taxes to the Romans anyway. It was a trap, and he knew it. I say, you have to love how Yahushua always managed to avoid their carefully laid traps, and they kept trying to trip him up, didn't they? And they were never able to do so. He was just too smart for them. Yes, exactly. All right, now this is the context in which he made a statement that some people try to use to prove there won't be marriage in the kingdom to come. But that's not what he was saying. And you'll see that when you take a look at the context in which his statements were made. Go ahead and keep reading for us from verse uh, 18. So that's Mark 12, verse 18. Okay. Then some Sadducees, who say there is no resurrection, came to him, and they asked him, saying, Teacher, Moses wrote to us that if a man's brother dies and leaves his wife behind and leaves no children, his brother should take his wife and raise up offspring for his brother. Now there were seven brothers. The first took a wife and dying, he left no offspring. And the second took her, and he died, nor did he leave any offspring. And the third likewise. So the seven had her and left no offspring. Last of all, the woman died also. Therefore, in the resurrection, when they rise, whose wife will she be? For all seven had her as wife. Yehoshua answered and said to them, Are you not therefore mistaken? because you do not know the scriptures nor the power of Yahuwah. For when they rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. But concerning the dead, that they rise, have you not read in the book of Moses, in the burning bush passage, how Yahuwah spoke to him, saying, I am the God, or Theos, of Abraham, the Theos of Isaac, and the Theos of Jacob. He is not the God of or Theos, of the dead, but the Theos of the living. You are therefore greatly mistaken. So the Pharisees have retired from the scene of battle. They couldn't trip him up with their question about the legality of paying taxes to Caesar. So they skedaddle out of there, and now the Sadducees give it a try. I find it interesting that the Saviour never denounced the Sadducees the way that he did the Pharisees. You almost get the feeling that the Sadducees were more, uh, you know, I don't know, uh, more sincere, maybe, you know. Uh, he certainly never accused them of being hypocrites the way that he did with the Pharisees. Yes, I've noticed that too. In fact, I'd say this was the strongest statement he ever made to them right here when he told them they were mistaken. Now, since we're looking at context, I want you to notice that this question is not actually about marriage in Yah's kingdom. It's not? No. That's where most people get this wrong. This passage isn't talking about marriage after the resurrection. Instead, it's talking about the resurrection itself. Notice what it says in verse 18 again. Just read that verse one more time. Mm -hmm. Then some Sadducees who say there is no resurrection came to him. The Sadducees didn't believe in a resurrection from the dead. It says so right there. The Pharisees failed to make Yahushua look like a fool, so the Sadducees are going to give it a try. And the point of doctrine they found to try and make him look foolish to the Sadducees was arguing over whether or not there is a resurrection. That's why, in Yahushua's response, he focuses on gently enlightening their understanding to the scriptural evidence for a resurrection from the dead. That's why he points his questioners back to Moses' conversation at the burning bush, where Yahuwah told him, verses 26 and 27, I am the God, or Theos of Abraham, the Theos of Isaac, and the Theos of Jacob. He is not the Theos of the dead, but the Theos of the living. He's telling them that the entire premise of their question is incorrect because they're coming at it from the assumption there is no resurrection from the dead, but he shows them logically that there is. Right, okay, okay. But what about verse 25 then? I mean, he does say, quote, For when they rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. 
So he's not he's not speaking strictly of the resurrection when he says they neither marry nor are given in marriage. Well, actually, he is, but we haven't recognised it because this is a particular phrase that doesn't have a literal translation. It's one right. of those meanings that sort of gets lost in translation. So that, what, does it, what does it mean? Well, we would say life as normal. How, how so, though? So I'm, I'm obviously I'm not saying this. OK, well, let's go to Luke. The various gospel accounts of this exchange between Christ and the Sadducees is all very similar, but let's take a look at it in Luke chapter 20, and then we're going to go to Luke 17. Aside from the accounts of this exchange, it's the only other place in the gospels where the phrase marry and given in marriage occurs. Right, okay, you do this often. Uh, Luke 20... Uh, Yeah, sorry, uh, (laughs) verses 27 to 40. You'll notice that all the same elements, as in Mark's account, are still there, as well as this phrase. Okay. Some of the Sadducees who say there is no resurrection came to Yahushua with a question. Teacher, they said, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies and leaves a wife but no children, the man must marry the widow and raise up offspring for his brother. Now, there were seven brothers. The first one married a woman and died childless. The second and then the third married her. And in the same way, the seven died, leaving no children. Finally, the woman died too. Now then, at the resurrection, whose wife will she be, since the seven were married to her? Yahushua replied, The people of this age marry and are given in marriage, but those who are considered worthy of taking part in the age to come and in the resurrection from the dead will neither marry nor be given in marriage, and they can no longer die, for they are like the angels. They are Yahuwah's children, since they are children of the resurrection. But in the account of the burning bush, even Moses showed that the dead rise For he calls Yahuwah, the God or Theos of Abraham, and the Theos of Isaac, and the Theos of Jacob. He is not the Theos of the dead, but of the living, for to him all are alive. Some of the teachers of the law responded, Well said, teacher, and no one dared to ask him any more questions. Note here that some of the teachers of the law were genuinely impressed with his answer, and they perceived that it had to do with whether or not there was a resurrection, Yahuwah says there will be, and not whether or not there will be marriage after the resurrection. Yahushua is using the phrase marriage and give in marriage as a way of speaking of your typical daily life, business as usual, and we can know that he meant it that way by going to Luke 17, You see, it wasn't a commonly used expression, even back then. This is the only other place in the Gospels, besides this exchange with the Sadducees, where this phrase occurs. So, Miles, it's Luke chapter 17 and verses 26 to 30. Just as it was in the days of Noah, so also will it be in the days of the Son of Man. People were eating, drinking, marrying, and being given in marriage up to the day Noah entered the ark. Then the flood came and destroyed them all. It was the same in the days of Lot. People were eating and drinking, buying and selling, planting and building. But the day Lot left Sodom, fire and sulphur rained down from heaven and destroyed them all. It will be just like this on the day the Son of Man is revealed. What Yahushua was talking about here, what he's trying to describe, is the cessation of life as normal. Just as it was in the days of Noah, when life was continuing on as normal, suddenly the flood came. This is how it will be in the days when the Son of Man returns. Just as it was in the days of Lot, when people were eating and drinking, buying and selling, etc., life was business as usual, until fire came from heaven and destroyed them all unexpectedly. He's talking about life as we know it, and one of the phrases to indicate life as we know it is marrying and giving in marriage. Let's look again at verse 27. People were eating, drinking, marrying, and being given in marriage up to the day Noah entered the ark. Then the flood came and destroyed them all. To my knowledge, no one has ever tried to suggest that after Yahushua returns, no one will eat and drink again, just because eating and drinking constitutes part of life as we know it. Well, no, in fact, at the Last Supper, Yahushua said he wouldn't drink of the cup again until he could drink of it with us In his father's kingdom. Right, that's a very good example, actually, yeah. So just because a phrase is used to indicate life as we know it 
does not mean we should take it literally. And yet that's what people do with the phrase marrying and giving in marriage, even though the only places it appears in the Gospels are places that in context are not actually speaking about marriage at all. OK, so if if we're going to accept that this phrase marrying and giving in marriage is simply a way of saying life as normal, then could you flip it around then and say that marrying and giving in marriage is an, an element to be expected in normal life? And the disruption of that is what's not normal. Absolutely, yes. Now, there's nothing in Christ's exchange with the Sadducees that indicates that they were speaking of marriage after the kingdom is set up. Or, for those who believe that they go to heaven after his return, there's nothing there that indicates there's no marriage after his return. That's not what he and the Sadducees were discussing, and no one back then thought otherwise. So, to take a single phrase out of context and insist that this means there'll be no more marriages after the Saviour's return is to miss the point of the passage entirely. Isn't that always what happens when we take something out of context, though? Seems like it, yes. Satan doesn't mind if we study our Bibles, so long as we don't take the time and the thought to carefully consider the context in which a particular passage occurs. He knows he can lead us off course if we do that. It's always important to take Scripture just as it reads and ask the Holy Spirit to guide us in our study. Okay, right. We'll be right back, and then we're going to start to talk about this some more. Please don't go away. The lockdowns due to COVID-19 changed the world forever. Many people thought back to the so-called Spanish flu pandemic from a hundred years before that had killed an estimated 25 to 50 million people worldwide. What the world had never seen before, however, were the national lockdowns, the curfews that kept people in their homes around the clock. It was a time of great difficulty for much of the world in countries where public transportation shut down, many of the poorer classes had no way to work and were in severe want. The church did not escape unscathed. Churches have long taught their congregants that the church is a place of safety and refuge. But in a time of international crisis, many churches shuttered their doors, remaining silent and aloof during a time when help and godly leadership were desperately needed. While some churches eventually resumed services, not all did. Many believers became disillusioned. Studies showed that church attendance after the lockdowns was far lower than it had been before. But this isn't necessarily a bad thing. Remember that Yahweh is always in control and he has a plan for believers. That plan is not to just join another congregation. Believers today are being called to leave the organised denominations, all of which have continued to cling to and teach error. You don't need humans to interpret the Bible for you, or to tell you what to believe. Let Yahweh be your teacher. Learn about Yahweh's plan for this final generation of believers. Look for the previously released radio programme entitled After Covid – the Church in the 21st Century. You can listen to it on our website or on YouTube. Once again, that's After Covid, The Church in the 21st Century. Learn about Yahweh's gracious plan for believers in this post-pandemic world. Really appreciate today's discussion. As you know, my wife and I have had a couple of kids of our own. Uh, cute little rug rats, as we call them. Tax write-offs. <laughs> Chips off the old block. Ankle biters. <laughs> well, they are actually. Uh, fortunately, past that stage of development anyway. Uh, this, this is a topic that really troubles a lot of young people, doesn't it? I remember when my wife and I had been married, uh, maybe about three or four months, we had some friends over for dinner, and among the couples invited, there was one really ancient couple. Oh, careful there, Miles. Steady on. <laughs> I mean, well, I mean, even for you, they'd be ancient, all right? Uh, <laughs> Thank there you. were uh, late eighties, I think, early nineties. It actually being the pastor of a church uh, my in-laws attended when uh, my wife was 
really little, very small. In fact, it had actually been their last church before retirement. Um, they really liked the community, so they stayed there for years afterwards. Anyway, um, we were newlyweds and looking forward to a life together. And my wife asked this retired minister if he thought we'd still be able to have children in heaven. Now, that's what we believed at the time that after Yahushua returns, we all go to heaven. Of course, now, with more careful Bible study, of, uh, we, we know that when Yahushua returns, he's going to set up Yahuwah's everlasting kingdom on earth. But the point remained, are we going to be able to have children in eternity? It's a fair distinction to make, as some people believe that there won't be marriage in heaven, but they believe that there will be in the earth made new, while others believe there won't be any marriage at all after Yahushua returns. So, go on, what did this elderly minister believe? Well, you see, with great authority and confidence, he declared there would be no marriage in either heaven or the earth made new. No one would have children either. Instead, we'd all live as brothers and sisters. His wife sat there with a sweet smile on her face, uh, gently nodding her head. <laughs> and what did your wife do? Well, she didn't say much, to be honest. Uh, she just kind of raised her eyebrows a little bit and said, interesting. <laughs> and then didn't say any more. And then... I was going to um, say, yes, I know your wife. <laughs> I, can't, I can't exactly picture her letting go with just an interesting... <laughs> Well, to be honest, she respected this man and his wife and didn't want to be rude. But, yeah, I got an earful later uh, when it was just the two of us. And the thing is, she was really upset. I mean, she said, look, they've been married for literally, what, decades. They've gotten to experience what it's like to be a wife, a husband, what it's like to have a child and raise it. You know, what's it like to see their children grow up and, and have children of their own? You know, by now they've got quite a few great grandkids and they've lived their lives and experienced it all. So what are they really giving up? Exactly, exactly. Mm. And then her resentment got the best of her and she said, at their age, they probably don't want to have sex anymore. So it's an easy thing for them to just sit there and say all that's going to come to an end when Christ returns. So, you know, maybe I shouldn't say that on air, to be honest. I'm, I'm sorry. But, but she was really upset and, frankly, I could see her point. No, Mars, I'm glad you brought this up, actually, because we Thank raise you. our children to have high standards, teaching them that physical intimacy is a precious gift that's to be mm. saved for marriage. And then we turn right round and tell them that Yahushua is coming soon and that after he comes, there goes their chance of experiencing for themselves marriage and everything that goes with it. And how are they supposed to feel then? We're not to impose the limitations of great age onto a healthy 25-year-old with all the healthy drives of a 25-year-old and then be surprised when a young person doesn't really want what's being offered. So I think it comes under that statement Paul wrote when he said, fathers do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. Yes, exactly. And that's the problem when we impose our own biases onto scripture and then authoritatively announce that our pet interpretation of a passage taken completely out of context is the only true interpretation. It's going to discourage souls, and we can almost guarantee that anything taken out of context is going to be interpreted incorrectly. Mm. So, in our last segment, you showed us how Christ and the Sadducees weren't actually talking about marriage at all. But that's like, you know, evidence by default, isn't it? Is there any other more definitive evidence for why you believe marriage will exist in Yahuwah's kingdom? Absolutely, yes. Let's start at Genesis. In fact, Genesis chapter 1, we all know how this chapter starts. In the beginning, Elohim created the heavens and the earth. This is the account of how he created our world. Then, as the crowning act of his creation, he made the human race and gave them a special work to do. Let's read verses 26 to 28. Then Elohim said, Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, over all the creatures that move along the ground. So Elohim created mankind in his own image. In the image of Elohim, he created them, male and female, he created them. Elohim blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky 
and over every living creature that moves on the ground. He goes on to explain what foods he's provided for them. And then verse 31 closes the chapter with, Elohim saw all that he had made, and it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Now the point I want you to notice here is that the fall hasn't happened yet. This is still paradise. Sin hasn't entered. And the committed relationship between the two, that committed relationship, which we now call marriage, was part of Yahuwah's original plan for the human race. Marriage, you could say, antedates sin. Hmm. Yeah, I can, I can see that. It's pretty much implied in verse 28 when Elohim tells them to be fruitful and multiply. The marriage lingo is even more clear in Genesis 2 because this gives the account of the creation of Adam in even, even more detail. And verse 18 there says that Yahweh Elohim said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now, can you read verses 21 through to 24 for us, please? So Yahweh Elohim caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. Then Yahuwah Elohim made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. The man said, This is now bone of my bones, and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. You might recognise verse 24 as being read at weddings. It's a common Bible verse to be read in Christian wedding ceremonies. Yeah, it was read at our bonus. Yeah, and here for the first time we encounter the word wife. So the marriage relationship was instituted as part of Yahuwah's original pre-sin plan, and it's not until the next chapter, that's Genesis 3, that the fall occurs. And what does Genesis chapter 3 verse 6 say? Uh, verse 6 says... When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it. Oftentimes we get this mental image of naughty Eve wandering away from her keeper and getting into trouble. But verse 6 sets the record straight. Adam was with Eve, and here he is referred to as her husband. So definitely marriage was instituted at creation. It predates the fall and is consequently part of Yahweh's original plan for the human race. Turn now to Acts chapter 3. Shortly after Pentecost, Peter and John went to the temple where they healed a lame man. Peter, of course, took advantage of the attention this generated to direct people's attention to the message of the Messiah and Yah's kingdom. Remember, the gospel message is the message of Yahweh's kingdom being restored on earth. So now read verses 19 to 21. What does it say? Repent then and turn to Yahweh, so that your sins may be wiped out. The times of refreshing may come from Yahweh, and that he may send the Messiah, who has been appointed for you, even Yahushua. Heaven must receive him until the time comes for Yahweh to restore everything as he promised long ago through his holy prophets. So what's this exciting promise of the gospel? The Messiah will return when it comes time for Yahuwah to do what? Restore everything. Right. Now, is it restoring everything to announce, yeah, and that's everything else being restored, but not the original plan for the human race? <laughs> well, welcome to eternity. No more sex ever again. <laughs> Intimacy in marriage is a precious gift. The Father's original plan in the creation of the human race was to populate the earth through the act of procreation. Well, you could say that he's going to populate it now with, with the redeemed. Of course, yes, and he is. But it's not true restoration back to his original plan in creation to restore everything else but not marriage. Mm. Let's move on now to Revelation chapter 21. This is the next to last chapter of the Bible. And let's see what it says about restoration here. So, Miles, could you just read for us Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 to 4? Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from Yah, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of Yahuwah is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. 
Yahuwah himself will be with them and be their Elohah, and Yah will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. When my wife and I were just starting our family, we had some friends that also wanted to start a family. They tried and tried. They wanted so badly to be able to have a child and were never able to do so. It seems reasonable that part of the promised wiping away every tear is to let such people finally experience what, through being born into an imperfect world, kept from them. It's a very human drive, isn't it, you know, to want to bring forth a child in your image? Absolutely. Now, of course, not everyone wants to have children, and that's fine. We're not animals. Everyone has the yah-given right to make such decisions for themselves, but certainly the desire to be fruitful and multiply is a very natural desire that was instituted as part of Yahweh's original plan for the human race. Another verse that points to marriage in Yah's kingdom is Ezekiel chapter 44, verse 22. Now this is a very curious passage because it's establishing the standards by which the priests of the millennial temple are to select their wives. Mm -hmm. So it's Ezekiel chapter 44, verse 22. Okay. They shall not take as wife a widow or a divorced woman, but take virgins of the descendants of the house of Israel or widows of priests. Now, there's one more passage I want to look at. This is Isaiah chapter 11. The chapter starts out with a prophecy of the Messiah. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots a branch will bear fruit. The spirit of Yahuwah will rest on him. The spirit of wisdom and of understanding. The spirit of counsel and of might. The spirit of the knowledge and fear of Yahuwah. And he will delight in the fear of Yahuwah. Right. So clearly this is a prophecy of the Messiah, but then the prophecy goes on and expands to describe what the world will be like during the years after Yahushua sets up Yah's kingdom on earth. Go ahead, could you just pick up where you left off? Uh, okay. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes or decide by what he hears with his ears, but with righteousness he will judge the needy. With justice he will give decisions for the poor of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. With the breath of his lips, he will slay the wicked. The wicked have never yet been slain. This is a prophecy of the future. It's describing what life in Yah's kingdom on earth will be like. Okay, keep going. We're getting to a very telling detail here. Righteousness will be his belt, and faithfulness the sash around his waist. The wolf will live with the lamb, the leopard will lie down with the goat. The calf and the lion and the yearling together, and a little child will lead them. The cow will feed with the bear, their young will lie down together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox. The infant will play near the cobra's den, and the young child will put his hand into the viper's nest. They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain, for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of Yahuwah as the waters cover the sea. Again, this is describing a reality we've not seen yet. And what do we find in the midst of this prophecy of a glorious future in Yahuwah's kingdom on earth? A little child and a young child and an infant. Right. And for this to be a vision of the ongoing glorious experiences waiting for us in the future, there would have to be children being born. Sure, there will be some children and even babies that are very young when the kingdom is set up, but they're not going to remain in, let's say, suspended animation, as it were, <laughs> kept from reaching maturity. No, this glimpse of the future shows us that children will be born and grow up in that glorious time after the wicked are destroyed and all things are restored back to the Father's original purpose in the creation of mankind. And that's really beautiful. It really is. We, we, we don't do the Father any favours when we take it upon ourselves to remove the very things he's given us to bring joy and happiness to our human experience. Yes, yes, I like that. Marriage is part of our human experience. And even in Yah's kingdom, after we're gifted with new, higher natures, after we're given new bodies, we will continue to be human. That's what he created us to be. And a large part of that human experience is being married having children. And that's part of what is to be restored when Yahweh's kingdom is set up on earth. 
Can you imagine how nice it will be to parent in a perfect environment with perfect unfallen natures? Not only us, yes, but the children too. It's going to be so nice, it really will. We won't even recognise it as parenting. And the same goes for the ideal marriage relationship too. It was designed to teach us about Yah and his love for us. He's not going to take away one of the biggest ways we learn about his infinite love. Good point, good point. Listen, don't go away, folks. When we return, Dave's going to share some points you can share with friends who insist it's important to be members of a particular church, whatever that church may be. Stay tuned. You are listening to World's Last Chance Radio on WBCQ at 93.30 kilohertz on the 31 metre band. World's Last Chance Radio, preparing a people for the Saviour's soon return. The devil isn't creative. If a particular deception has worked once, he'll use it again and again under various disguises. This is what's happening now in certain circles where some people are trying to discredit the book of Daniel. If you haven't yet encountered this heresy, just wait, you will. There are solid arguments to counter this error. Look for the article called Daniel the Prophet on our website. It contains information you need to know. That's Daniel the Prophet on worldslastchance.com. Today's question from our daily mailbag is coming from... Drumroll, please. The Sahara Desert. The desert? Really? Well, Egypt. Most of it is covered by the Sahara. Uh, Specifically, it's coming from Tanta, Egypt. Now, Egypt has such a rich and fascinating culture and heritage. In fact, did you know, Dave, that right now they're in the process of moving their capital city? Really? What, it's not going to be Cairo anymore? (laughs) No, 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 no. Oh, so where are they moving it to? Um, uh, um, Alexandria? Uh, no, 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 no. Actually, they actually have a city they're building just for being the new capital. And so I've seen some pictures of the plans for it. It's really impressive, actually. Uh, very, very organised and very, very beautiful and very high tech as well. It's specifically designed to operate with smart technology. Wow. And what's its name? Oh, well, it's not got a name yet, to be honest. Oh, right. <laughs> for now, they're just calling it the new administrative capital. <laughs> Well, I shall have to look that one up. That does sound very interesting, and I wasn't aware of it. Anyway, what is today's question? Well, a woman by the name of Wafia writes, quote, I was raised a Coptic Christian. Recently, I met an evangelical missionary. She and her family are Protestants from North America and are really pushing their denomination as the only true church. I don't believe that you have to be members of a particular denomination in order to be saved, but I'm not sure how to explain why. What are your thoughts on this? I know you are not affiliated with a particular denomination, but where did this idea come from and how do I politely combat it? Well, I'm glad that uh, Wafia, is that how you say it? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Well, I'm glad that she can see that it's not necessary to be members of any particular denomination in order to be saved. As we've covered in previous programmes, which she's probably heard if she spent any time on our website, the command of Revelation 18 is what? Go out of her, my people. Right. It's not an invitation, as it's typically translated, come out of her. It's not an invitation to leave one organisation and just bind yourself to another. It's a divine command to leave all organised churches and religions because all have drunk of the wine of the wrath of Babylon. All have errors in their belief systems that they still cling to. In order to follow Yahuwah's leading, we have to free ourselves from all of the fallen churches. People proselytise because they think their denomination has a monopoly on truth, but there's not a single one that isn't fallen. Right. But it's more than that. Salvation, as we know it, is not a group activity. It's something no one can accept or affect for another. Each person has to accept the invitation individually for themselves. Ezekiel 14, verse 20. As surely as I live, declares the sovereign Yahuwah, even if Noah, Daniel and Job were in it, they could save neither son nor daughter. 
they would save only themselves by their righteousness. Exactly. Now, different denominations have their own personal take on this belief. You've got some, such as the Roman Catholic Church and possibly the Coptic Church, I don't know, that believe the church is the gateway to salvation. You can't be saved without being a member of their church, or so they believe. Others believe that, while others outside their denomination may be saved, it's only those who haven't been presented with the truths their particular flavour of Christianity teaches. If you have heard of it and persist in refusing to join, well then, you're lost, because you've had the chance to accept the truth, their version of it anyway, and you've rejected it. Mm, I see I've encountered that attitude before. The thing that people should understand is that this is simply an extension of the same old, same old assumption that you have to be a member of this or that religion to escape punishment after death. And, on the other hand, you can see why people can feel that way. If they've any degree of intellectual honesty, they're not going to be members of a denomination or religion which they know to be in error. They're going to believe their religion or their denomination has truth, or they wouldn't be a member of it. Mm, that's true. The thing that most people don't understand or recognise, however, is that if you follow the money, so to speak, if you trace this attitude and belief back to its original source, you'll find it all leads back to Satan's agenda for divisiveness. He doesn't care which religion or organisation or denomination you happen to be in, so long as you're not actively seeking more truth and you're content on the assumption that you already possess all the information you need. That's a good point, Dave. And you have to admit, all this divisiveness uh, is not a good look for Christians. It's an undeniable fact that there are tens of thousands of Christian denominations in the world today. True, it's fact. But there are so many that non-Christians point to it as proof, so they claim, why Christianity is in error. How can you claim you have the truth, they scoff, when you can't even agree amongst yourselves as to what is truth? Well, I hate to say it, but yes, that's a fair point. And that's the hidden devilish agenda behind it. You can see that same agenda at work in the fact that Judaism has three distinct sects, Islam has five, and Hinduism has four main sects with many more minor sects. And that's just four of the world's many religions. Mm. You can see how Satan uses the old divide-and-conquer technique to keep people clinging to the various traditions they were raised in, assuming their specific brand of belief is superior to all others. So where did this idea come from? Then? You mean aside from the spiritual pride and arrogance that always exists in the human heart? Yeah, aside from that. <laughs> Well, I don't know where in every religion, but in Christianity it probably came from a linguistic sleight of hand. In the Athanasian Creed, which Roman Catholic priests read, it starts with these words. It says, Whosoever wishes to be saved, before all things it is necessary that he hold the Catholic faith, which faith except every one do keep whole and undefiled, without doubt he shall perish eternally. Now the Catholic faith is this, and it goes on from there. Now, what most believers today have forgotten is that the word Catholic simply means universal. So when it's talking about the Catholic faith, that's an umbrella term. It's saying that if you want to be saved, you have to embrace the universal faith. But that's not how we use the term anymore. So people assume the term is referring to the Roman Catholic denomination. That's why it's a problematic term, because there's a mix of terms and assumptions are made. Yeah, I can see that. Um, we're safest out of all organised religions, folks. Not only is that what Revelation teaches for this final generation, but when you're walking an independent path, you rely more heavily on Yahuwah to be your teacher, not some fallible human that's simply repeating individualistic denomination creeds. Okay, um... I think we've got time, yeah, we have, uh, for one very quick question. Sandy in a place that I can't pronounce, somewhere in the United States. Oh, is it? Is it an Indian word? Some of those can be very difficult to pronounce. <sighs> yeah, it must be. Anyway, uh, Sandy says, As a kid, I was really committed to Yah, but in my 20s, I fell away from my early beliefs and practices. Within the last couple of years, I've been making a really concerted effort to return to Yahuwah, but I'm scared of falling away again. Do you have any words of advice for me? It takes a lot of courage to admit that. 
I think that's something a lot of us can relate to, although most of us don't have the courage to openly admit it in the way that Sandy has. Yeah, that's true. Well, first, I'd say that you don't have to be afraid of a defeated foe, which the devil is. He can't snatch you out of the Father's hand against your will, and the Father's grip is a hold that nothing can break. Absolutely, yeah. But, I mean, Yahuwah will never force a human will. I really understand Sandy's concerns here. There's a fear of losing the desire to be close to Yahuwah. What do you do then? You know, it's, it's, a, well, it's all very well and good, actually, to say that Yahuwah will never let you go. But we all know that he always respects our personal right to choose. How do you keep from exercising that fallen nature and turning your back on Yah? I can really understand this worry. I really can. Yes, you're right. Yahuwah will never force our will. But there is something you can do. You don't have to just kind of hover in fearful limbo, wondering if some morning you're going to wake up and turn your back all of a sudden on the Father. It doesn't work that way. So let's turn to Psalm 119. This is the longest psalm in Scripture, and it has so much deep wisdom in it. Psalm 119 for us, Miles, please. Could you read verses um, 9 to 11? Sure, absolutely. How can a young person stay on the path of purity? By living according to your word. I seek you with all my heart. Do not let me stray from your commands. Okay, I'm not actually seeing how this is a solution to the problem, though. How do you continue to seek Yah in the whole heart? Keep reading. You're not quite finished yet. What does verse 11 say? I'm sorry. Um, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. When we make the effort and take the time to hide scripture in our hearts, several things happen. First, it keeps our minds occupied. It's much more difficult to let the mind wander into temptation when it's actively engaged concentrating on something. That's a very good point. And secondly, memorizing scripture actively engages the mind with something useful. That way, in the future, if you encounter some unexpected temptation or difficulty, the spirit of Yah can bring to your mind the very passage of Scripture you need to stand firm under temptation. Just pick up the passage again at the next verse. Can you read through to the end of that section to verse 16? Praise be to you, Yahuwah. Teach me your decrees. With my lips I recount all the laws that come from your mouth. I rejoice in following your statutes as one rejoices in great riches. I meditate on your precepts and consider your ways. I delight in your decrees. I will not neglect your word. This is how we keep on the straight and narrow. We fill our mind with Yahweh's word. We don't waste mental space on the latest Hollywood movie. We keep our eyes focused on the end goal, which is our inheritance in the kingdom of Yah. That's how, step by step, we stay faithful to Yah. This doesn't mean we're suddenly sinless, but it's how we keep our focus where it should be, occupied with the deep mysteries of Yah's word. That's excellent. Really is great news. Such practical advice as well, Dave. I appreciate learning that too. Up next is Lisa O'Brien with The Daily Promise. By the way, if you've got a question or a prayer request, just go to worldslastchance.com and click on Contact Us. You always enjoy receiving your messages. This is Elise O'Brien with today's Daily Promise from Yah's Word. I have always loved stories, and the stories I like the most are stories that inspire me to have greater faith, to be more compassionate and kind, to be more forgiving to others' mistakes. When looking for stories that illustrate the wonderful promises given us in Scripture, I try very hard to always choose true stories that actually happened. Not parables or made-up stories that illustrate a point. I try to select stories of real events. So I'm going to be honest that I do not know if today's story actually happened or not. 
However, I think you'll agree that it certainly could have happened just the way described. The story is that in a certain city in Spain, a man had a teenaged son that was constantly pushing boundaries. The father naturally wanted the son to excel in life, so he wasn't pleased that his boy, whom I'll call Javi, put so little effort into his classes and only seemed interested in girls and hanging out with his friends. The relationship became very strained. Fights became more and more frequent. Finally, things reached ahead when Javi ran away from home. The father, who loved his son very much, was devastated. He thought at first his son would be home soon, but the days passed and Javi didn't return. He tried contacting Javi's friends, but if they knew where his son was, they weren't saying. The father became more and more desperate. Days turned into weeks, but Javi's dad didn't give up. In the evenings after work, he would drive around the city asking groups of homeless people if they'd seen his son. His efforts were all in vain. Finally, after months of fruitless searching, Javi's father decided to take out an ad in the city newspaper. The ad said, quote, Dear Javi, meet me in front of the newspaper office at noon. All is forgiven. I love you, Dad. The next day at noon, over 500 Javis showed up, wanting forgiveness, longing for reconciliation with their fathers. When I read this story, it reminded me of Psalm 103, verses 13 and 14. It says, As a father has compassion on his children, so Yahweh has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows how we are formed. He remembers that we are dust. I love that. He remembers that we're dust. He knows our limitations and our failings, and he doesn't hold them against us. Instead, Yahweh has compassion on us. James 1 verse 5 assures us, If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask Yahweh, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. Your Heavenly Father doesn't find fault with you. He's not a scold. He has compassion in His heart for you, and His love for you is without end. We have been given great and precious promises. Go and start claiming. Today's discussion has really clarified, in my mind, not only the topic of marriage in the kingdom of Yah, but also the importance of understanding things in context. It's so easy to take a verse here and a passage there and wrench it out of context and then extrapolate from that to come up with some whole new teaching that may or may not be right. I'd say most of the time such extrapolations aren't right. And the problem is that these erroneous doctrines misrepresent the father, like all error does. Mm. But more than that, error discourages the soul. You think of your wife's reaction when, as a young bride, she was told that she could expect to miss out on all these wonderful experiences she'd longed to have just because she was born too late. Yeah, it really bothered her, it really did. And we felt the old guy was wrong, but we had no way to prove it. We had no clear understanding like you've presented to us today as to why we could expect to enjoy marriage in, well, at the time, we assumed we'd go to heaven. But either way, heaven or the earth made new. We had nothing but our strong desire that he was wrong to tell us what the truth was. And it was very discouraging to my bride. Earlier, you referred to Colossians chapter 3, verse 21. Another translation says, Fathers, do not embitter your children, or they will become discouraged. As a biblical principle, this applies to more than just parents and children. It also applies to believers who are more mature in the faith. We should never discourage those who are young in the faith. If they ask us questions we can't answer, let's not be too proud to admit that we don't know. 
then use that as a reason to go study and find the answers that we're lacking. But no, just giving a lazy, automatic answer doesn't help anyone, and it misrepresents the father who always wants our happiness. Which is, yet again, a very good point, Dave. When we're in the position of being the authority, of sharing what we know with others, it's easy to assume we must always have an answer ready for any and, and all questions. But admitting that we don't know is better than just coming up with some quick answer that may or may not be correct. And that may or may not discourage the questioner. I find that I actually have more respect for someone if they're honest enough to admit they don't have the answer to my question. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. It's, it's this side of the kingdom, no one's going to have all the answers. Being humble enough to admit when a person doesn't know something always increases my respect for that person. It shows they're humble enough to not put on airs or pretend to be superior. What's the first verse of Psalm 23? How does it start? Uh, Yahuwah is my shepherd. I shall not want. The kingdom of Yah is to restore earth and humanity back to Yahweh's original plan in our creation. An integral part of that is populating the earth, not just with the redeemed, but with the children of the redeemed. What commission were Adam and Eve given when they were created? Genesis chapter 1 verse 28. Let me just click there now. Uh, Elohim blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. This statement lays out the original divine plan in the creation of the human race. It predates sin, so this is a big part of what will be restored when the kingdom of Yahuwah is set up on earth. And as in everything else, it shows the love of the Father and his desire to give us everything that brings us joy. That is his focus, isn't it? Our joy, our happiness. What a wonderful, loving creator. And being our creator, he knows just what we need to be fully happy, content and fulfilled. We hope you'll be able to join us again tomorrow. And until then, remember, Yahuwah loves you and he is safe to trust. been listening to WLC Radio. World's Last Chance is committed to bringing the gospel of the Kingdom of Yah to the world. Prophecy and current events indicate the Saviour will return in the very near future. This will be followed by gifting the saints with immortality and setting up Yah's kingdom here on earth. There's no time to waste. Accept the gift of salvation today and allow Yahuwah to cover you with the righteousness of Christ. This programme, as well as past episodes of Radio WLC, are available on our website at worldslastchance.com. Click on the Radio WLC icon at the top right of the home page. Join us again tomorrow for another truth-filled message on WBCQ at 9330 kHz on the 31 meter band. WLC Radio, preparing a people for life in Yahuwah's earthly kingdom to be established upon Christ's imminent return.